think I will start with this session. Uh, just now we have a very impressive session. It's about the air pollution and the effect of the uh, health effect. Uh, but now we have a more instructive, constructive uh, session. It's about the built environment and the health promotion. And, and uh, the first speaker is uh, uh, Lindsay Marr, and uh, he, she's the uh, uh, she, she, she got her PhD from the Berkeley, and she's now the professor at the Civil uh, Environmental Engineering and the Virginia Tech. And she's going to talk about the factors shaping the human exposure in the built environment. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Lacey Mark. to the conference organizers for inviting me. I've actually been on sabbatical here in the College of Public Health at National Taiwan University for the past uh, 11 months. And um, they've been wonderful hosts. It's been great to get to know Taiwan better. And this is a, an exciting way to kind of cap off my visit here because I'm heading home in a week. I'd like to acknowledge, I'll be talking today about factors shaping the human exposome in the built environment. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on this. Don John Dai, AJ Prussen, who's here attending in the audience, uh, Peter Bickerson, Mark Edwards, and Amy Pruden. We are all in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge Fulbright. I'm up here on a Fulbright scholarship. They also, for those of you who are interested, Fulbright also offers scholarships for um, researchers and students to come to the United States. It's kind of an exchange program and uh, funding for a lot of the work that's kind of behind what I'm going to talk about today comes from the Sloan Foundation, the US EPA, NIH, and NSF, and Virginia Tech's Institute for Critical Technology and Applied Science. So I'm going to start out by talking about causes of disease. If you, um, we, we, start, we finally finished sequencing the human genome in 2003. It was the Human Genome Project. And one of the thoughts going into that was that if we sequence the whole genome, we might gain a lot of insight and, and much better understanding into the causes of disease. And I remember when we finished sequencing it, I thought, oh, this, it, but it was kind of anticlimactic in a way because they, we had all the, the sequence and then, then what? Well, we have since learned that the genome really only accounts for about 10% or is responsible for 10% of the causes of human disease and that um, the exposome, including behavioral behavior, is responsible for 90% of the causes of disease. So for those, I know a couple of our speakers have mentioned the exposome previously, and many of you, I'm sure, know of it, but for those who don't, I want to define it formally. It's the totality of exposure that individuals experience over their lives, entire life, including chemicals and microbes and physical factors like yeah, radiation in water, food, and air. Um, people have defined three domains of the exposome. The first of these is the general external environment. So when we're thinking about what's in the outdoors, what's in our kind of green spaces and our urban environment, and uh, we have different sources like the petrochemical facility that Professor Jen talked about, traffic of course, and relationships, that's, that's this external environment. And then we also have this specific internal environment where it's kind of what we are directly in contact with, whether it's cigarette smoke or certain types of consumer products and what we put into our bodies. And then finally, there's the internal environment where we have the other omics, the transcriptomics, proteomics, met metabolomics, what's happening inside. So the built environment, although it appears as the general external environment, we kind of interact with it, in, we're inside, and it's more of a kind of specific external, external environment. So when we think about exposure to pollution, and people think, oh, air pollution or water pollution, and they often think about um, something like these photos here, you know, air pollution on a smoggy day in Los Angeles or in Beijing, or water pollution, have a polluted beach or a contaminated river. 
But there's also indoor pollution. Um, this is a bit uh, dramatized here in the upper right-hand side, but it's what's in our indoor air. It's not, you know, we would like to think, oh, it's very clean, um, but in fact, there are numerous pollutants, some unique to the indoor environment that we are exposed to. Um, and the same is true for our water. So that between the water source, whether it's groundwater or a river, and it, when it comes out of your tap, there's a lot of processing that happens and opportunities for whatever was in the water to change or for new things to get into the water. And the photo on the lower right was actually taken by one of our students and it's a water coming out of the faucet in Flint, Michigan, which I'm sure you've heard about with the lead problem that they had a couple years ago. The indoor environment or the built environment is critical because we spend 90% of our time in the built environment. And so that's really what is determining our exposure. So if we start, there's, there's kind of a, a, a whole host of different types of things that we're exposed to in the built environment here. I'll kind of go through them, starting at the top, going clockwise. There's uh, particulate matter, PM10, PM2.5, much smaller. Um, and that would be coming from sources such as cooking or heating, combustion, or resuspended dust, um, a lot of which is human skin cells and other things. Uh, there's volatile organic compounds that can off-gas from products that we use or from furniture. There's biotoxins, which may be coming from fungi or other microbes in the built environment. Trace metals um, could be in our water. It could also be in the air. There's microbes. Interactions between people and pets also is another source of exposure. Um, and then we have the, the pH of water, which can affect many different aspects of water chemistry. Lead, of course, in water and in dust. And then DBPs are disinfection byproducts, or what, which I'll talk about a little more in a bit. So the question I want to address today is, can we intentionally engineer a healthy built environment exposome? And I, I admit, we don't exactly know what that healthy exposome is, but I want to go through some of the factors that can affect what we're exposed to in the built environment. And I will uh, cover kind of three different media that are, let's say, not routes of exposure, but kind of points of contact in the built environment. We'll look at water, air, and surfaces. And I'll step through areas where different choices that we make can affect the exposome in each of those uh, areas. And then I'll go into a specific example for each one. So for the waterborne exposome, you, you go get a drink out of the tap and you don't think much about it. But where, you know, that water is actually coming from um, some source, such as a river or groundwater, it goes through a water treatment plant where we choose to use different processes such as biofiltration or, and disinfection, often with chlorine. It travels through a water main, which takes it to your residence. That main, that pipe, is made out of a certain material. Um, there may be some disinfectant residual still in the water there. And then it gets to your residence, travels through a service line, which may be made of another type of material. And then finally, it gets into your residence, your home or apartment, and goes through what's called a premise plumbing. We're plumbing the pipes and, and um, faucets and uh, fixings that are on the premises. And that can be yet another type of material. Um, we further modify what's in the water by sending it through a water heater. And then even the, the type of faucet can affect the ex what you're exposed to. So one example of a, a choice we're faced with is whether to choose copper versus plastic pipe for our home. And we often choose on the basis of price, durability, ease of installation, but there's also some exposome-related factors to consider. Um, so copper, for example, can leach dissolved copper ions into the water. This is more of a problem when the copper is new and it hasn't developed a scale. Um, and also when the water's been sitting in there for a while and there's been more opportunity for dissolution and for that to build up. On the other hand, um, copper has been shown to be antimicrobial, so that can help reduce the amount of bacteria in the water. Now, if you look at plastic pipes, especially what's called PECS now, is the acronym for it, um, a recent study by one of our graduates who is now at Purdue 
uh, show that plastic, those pipes leach organic compounds. They have found cyclohexane in the water, toluene, and xylene. And that is an issue not only for those compounds, but those compounds provide nutrients for bacteria to grow. So the pipes that you see in the hardware store are nothing like the pipes after they've been installed in your residence for a while. Um, you get development of a biofilm on the inside of, uh, oftentimes. And a biofilm is kind of a, a group of bacteria and other microorganisms that are adhered to a surface. A famous um, or a well-known example of a biofilm is the plaque on your teeth or rocks in a river, especially if they're a little slimy, that's the, the biofilm on there. So if we have water coming into our pipe, over here, and maybe it contains some trace amount of organic and inorganic material, and maybe a small amount of uh, cells. There's a, a biofilm on the inside of this pipe, and we zoomed in here, and you can see it's very irregularly shaped. There's a whole ecology uh, and life going on in here. Um, the more organics we provide it, and if those are leaching from the plastic pipe into the water, the more um, that can grow. And so then when you're the water, when you draw the water from that pipe, you can be exposed to organic compounds, which came from the pipe material, microorganisms that were fed by that, and possibly even biotoxins, things released by the microorganisms that can be harmful to human health. So that's more of a known issue with uh, things like algae and microsystems and algal, you've heard about algal blooms, for example, last year there was a huge bloom in Lake Erie near Pennsylvania that affected the water supply there. Another factor that matters if are flow conditions. So whether the water stagnates for a while or whether there's a sudden burst of flow, all of these things can affect how much leaching there is and then how much biofilm growth there is and then how much of bacteria detach and end up in your water. So my next um, kind of material in the indoor environment or media, let's say, is, is the air. And there's numerous points where different choices we make can affect our exposome. And these have to do largely with ventilation, for example, if your window is open and you're bringing in outside air, um, and how, how quickly that air changes over in the room, in the house, uh, whether there's a HVAC system, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system, what kind of filtration is on there, um, whether you have some recirculation, Again, pets and humans contribute to what's in there, bioeffluence and resuspension of dust. And then we can have water to air transfer from faucets in our bathrooms and our kitchens. So an example of how um, factors in the built environment can affect what we're exposed to in air, I'll focus on um, airborne pathogens, because that is something we are exposed to. And the influenza virus is something that my research group has studied intensely for the past five to 10 years. So the virus by itself is about 0.1 microns in size. Um, some would call it the ultrafine or nanoparticle. But when it's released into air from an infected individual, it's part of a larger respiratory droplet that can range in size from anywhere from submicron up, up to you know, tens, hundreds of microns, large enough to see those large droplets that come out. So once it's released into the air, it's subject to evaporation. Your respiratory tract is saturated at 100% relative humidity, and then you take that droplet and put it into a much drier environment, and it's gonna lose some water until it reaches equilibrium. And that happens fairly quickly. So for example, a droplet that was initially 0.5 microns in diameter might shrink down to 0.2 microns in diameter. And then once you have those droplets in the air, they're subject to different removal processes, either by ventilation or gravitational settling. And in the case of, of bioactive uh, agents, they can be subject to inactivation. Or if it's a chemical contaminant, it can be subject to chemical reactions that might transform it from being something that's toxic to something that's not toxic. So if we look at the removal efficiency, um, we did some modeling here, and we look at the removal efficiency by different processes that I showed you in the little diagram of the house on the previous slide. We have settling, ventilation, and inactivation across the bottom, and then kind of the sum total of all of those. And this figure on the left is at a lambda, or an air exchange rate, of one air change per hour, meaning on average the entire volume of that room 
uh, is replaced in an hour. So that's one of my variables. And then relative humidity is another variable in the built environment. And so the co different colors represent different relative humidities from 10% very dry up to 90%, which would be quite humid for the indoor environment. And you can see that um, under these conditions, we have very effective removal, high efficiency of removal by gravitational settling. Um, the, the droplets stay in the air. Um, for a while, they're not removed by the ventilation rate's fairly low, so ventilation is less of a factor in removing these. We do have some removal by inactivation, um, and it's strongly, in this case, it's strongly dependent on relative humidity. And of course, this depends on whatever agent it is that you're interested in, whether that depends on humidity or not. Now, if we look at a different condition where we have an air exchange rate of 10 air changes per hour, like you might see in a hospital or a, a, a certain types of commercial buildings, now you can see that um, ventilation plays a much larger role, uh, a much larger, has a much greater efficiency in removal. These, we don't expect these to add up to 100%, by the way. Um, and it's independent of humidity. We still have the inactivation, which depends on humidity. So the take-home message, and of course, this removal efficiency then determines how much is left in the air, which determines our exposure. So you can see here that the, um, the removal efficiency and thus our exposure will depend on the ventilation rate and the relative humidity. And this is going to be true for other contaminants in indoor air. Um, the last media that I want to talk about is the, is the surface. So if you've ever um, had the opportunity to renovate a house or choose new countertop material, you might be faced with this, this, this array of choices, whether you want to choose butcher block, which is wood, or granite, or marble, or limestone, different types of rock. Um, there's you know, kind of manufactured types of products, like quartz and solid surface, or more ceramic, like tile. And these can matter too, although we know less about how factors in the built environment affect the surface borne um, exposome. And we, we just know less about that in general. But the material can make a difference. The moisture content can matter, especially for microbial growth. Um, the texture can matter in terms of how much uh, will be transferred to your hand, for example, if you touch it. Um, and then on some products, we see an antimicrobial coating. So an example of, of how our choices in the built environment could affect um, our exposome, uh, we're looking here at diethyl hexyl phthalate uptake on surfaces. So the graph on the left shows you time on the x-axis. This is a time series. And what we did is we took these different materials, ground glass, which is like that frosted glass, um, polished glass, acrylic, form of plastic, and aluminum. And we had a very small chamber that we put these into. And we had um, phthalate coming from a, uh, a source that was actually a certain type of vinyl flooring with a large, with maybe 15% by weight, diethyl hexyl phthalate. And then we looked at how much sorbed, because DDHP is semi-volatile, so it kind of slowly volatilizes out of the vinyl flooring into the air has a very low vapor pressure, and then so it wants to sorb back to surfaces, and so it then sorbs to our different materials. And you can see that over time that um, much more sorbs to ground glass than the other three materials. So at a certain time, let's say 200 hours, we have maybe 400 nanograms of DHP, but nearly 1,000 nanograms of DHP on the ground glass. And then there's also an important word up here, which is clean because if that material is soiled, and the way we got them soiled is that we put the materials um, in the kitchen, kind of on the counter near a stove for a week, and they didn't necessarily get directly splashed on, but you know, when you cook, you get, you're cooking with oil, and it volatilizes, and then it kind of recondenses on the surfaces, so they, they kind of collected a layer of grime, let's say, from the air. And then once we uh, looked at the soil surfaces, there's a couple things to notice. First of all, the axes here, the axis values are much higher on the right than on the left. So we're sorbing quite a bit more into the soil, into this layer of brine, really. And then also, all of our different materials, whether it's aluminum, polished glass, or ground glass, 
they're all the same now. Before ground glass was different, now it's the same. And it turns out that this probably has to do with the, the kind of microscopic scale surface area of the ground glass versus the others, but um, you can read more about it in this publication. So the, the message from this is that uh, uptake of phthalates on clean ground glass is greater than on clean polished glass and clean aluminum, but uptake on the soiled surfaces is the same for all materials. So then this has the potential to affect um, what we're exposed to in terms of dermal contact with those materials. So there's two things here, right? There's the type of material, and then there's whether it's clean or soiled. So I've talked about each of the three media separately, air, water, and surface, but obviously there, there can be interactions between these, um, whether between just two or between three in terms of transfer of some of these contaminants that we're concerned about. Um, between those, among those. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of examples of these interactions. We'll focus on water to air transfer in both cases because uh, my, my area of expertise is kind of contaminants in air. Um, so one will be on chemicals. And an example here is that you can have uh, chlorine in your water. So there's you know, low amounts of chlorine, a residual that's left in there. If the water treatment plant uses that as its disinfectant. And then if you choose to use antibacterial soap that has triclosan in it, the chlorine can react with the triclosan within a minute and form chloroform along with other compounds. And so uh, this, <laughs> this image is, is actually, so you've probably seen in movies or TV shows, somebody comes up with a, a wet rag with chloroform, you, you kind of stick it over the face of the person you're trying to knock out and they just faint right away. Well, it turns out, while I was searching for this, I found out that it's totally false. It would take about five minutes of exposure to, for them to pass out for future reference. And so we've, again, we've, we've, there are factors in the built environment, right? We've chosen to use chlorine as a disinfectant. We've chosen to use some antibacterial soap. And by the way, I think a study has shown that the antibacterial nature of the soap doesn't really help remove any more bacteria than if you just use regular soap. Um, and, and now we're forming some compound which has a very high vapor, which is toxic itself, and has a very high vapor pressure, so it's going to get into the air and lead to an inhalation exposure. And then an example of water to air interactions um, from the mic uh, of, for microbes is that uh, we can have you have our hot water heater, Legionella, like elevated temperatures, so you can have Legionella, which causes Legionnaire's disease, can cause a form of pneumonia, uh, severe enough that there's a, it has a mortality rate of, I think, 10% roughly. Um, but you can have Legionella growing in your water heater, depending, again, on kind of the disinfectant and the temperature that you choose, and that can come out through your shower and then get aerosolized from your shower head, depending on what kind of shower head you've chosen to use. And then you could inhale that because you need to inhale it in order to contract the disease um, with Legionella and other opportunistic pathogens. So some of the choices here that can lead to that exposure or affect that exposure are, again, the water temperature, the pipe material, and the disinfectant. So uh, it's, it's obviously it's very complicated in turn. We still don't know enough to, to be able to answer these questions, but overall we need to think about optimizing the exposome. We can't eliminate all exposures, but as an example, if we think about the amount of chlorine in water, we're kind of, we have to weigh the different trade-offs. So if we put, this shows kind of dose of chlorine, so if we have a low amount of chlorine in our water, then our chemical exposure to chlorine and its byproducts, some of the trihalomethanes, are fairly low. But if we use a higher amount of chlorine, we have the potential for more exposure to those chemicals. However, if we use a low amount of chlorine, then we have uh, greater microbial growth, greater potential for exposure to those. But if we use a high amount of chlorine, then there's uh, going to be less microbes since it's killing them off. Um, and then the overall exposome is kind of shown here, depicted by the black line. And it, you know, this is totally arbitrary how we drew it, because it really it would depend on how you would weight the, the hazards of each of these different types of exposures but maybe you would want to end up somewhere kind of at the minimum to optimize that, and then there could be engineering factors that could push that whole curve down. 
Um, another example is, uh, as I alluded to earlier, is the temperature setting of your water heaters. And somebody yesterday talked about scalding as being a hazard to children. So as we increase the temperature of our water heater, we run into a scalding risk. And obviously, with the orange, then the orange line shows um, that as you raise the temperature, it costs more in terms of energy. But in terms of Legionella, Legionella has this sweet spot of temperatures where it likes to, to grow. But if you get above that temperature, then you'll, they won't be able to replicate and you won't have the risk of Legionella exposure. Um, and then this black line, again, kind of shows you a, a rough sum of all those where you might want to try to choose some middle point to optimize um, among not just exposure, but now all these other factors that we want to consider. So what does the future look like? Um, where are we going with this? Obviously, it was very, it was relatively easy to sequence the human genome. There's just, everyone has the same number of chromosomes. There's really only four letters we have to worry about. The exposome is a much more, uh, I'd call it a wicked problem in trying to assess our exposure to everything over an entire lifetime. Um, some of the tools that are gonna help get us there, as far as we need to go at least, would be things like portable DNA sequencing. So now there's these almost handheld types of instruments where you can um, take a sample and get the DNA sequence. Uh, I think the combination of novel sensors plus data analytics might, will help us move a lot in that direction. Obviously, we need to link the exposome to health outcomes or studies that are starting to look at that. Um, and then also to evaluate trade-offs, not just between different uh, types of contaminants that we might be exposed to, but also kind of considering those in the greater context of cost um, and other factors. And then finally, you've probably heard about LEED certification. I've been talking about the built environment. There's also well building certification now where they, there's several different standards that you have to meet and it considers um, things in air, carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds, things in water, and these other things that kind of contribute to building wellness. That's all I have, and I'd be happy to take any, maybe one question.